Um, it's a great pleasure this morning to, uh, to welcome, welcome back uh, Benedict Diestel, uh who will tell us today, talk to us today on the indis indispensability of mathematics to philosophy. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Um, so this is joint work with Walter Dean, who thankfully is here and can answer all of the questions that I can't. So I'm going to kick off with more or less what I was saying in the panel discussion, so just a brief recap for anyone who wasn't there or who may have forgotten sleep. Um, so I'm going to kick off with these three observations about philosophical practice. And here I take it philosophical practice to be uh, a relatively contemporary philosophical practice within a relatively narrow, but perhaps representative of broader trends, uh, slice of philosophy, let's say Anglo-American philosophy um, in a particular analytic tradition, but nonetheless one that I would say is dominant in the current profession. So, one thing is that many arguments in uh, contemporary core philosophy, let's call it metaphysics, epistemology, um, even ethics, uh, rely on mathematical premises, whether tacit or explicit. And uh, you know, examples of these like, that I mentioned last time include uh, Dutch book theorems in epistemology um, being used for these Dutch book arguments, for example, uh, for probabilism to the claim that our degrees of belief should be probabilistically coherent. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about later on, impossibility theorems in social choice theory. For example, you know, maybe we're not claim that uh, democracy is actually impossible. Uh, we're going to justify it using some mathematics. So the second observation is just that anti-realist and reductivist views about mathematics are common amongst these core philosophers, as we'll call them. And when I say anti-realist, I just mean the denial of the existence of mathematical objects, uh, or perhaps just the denial of um, mathematical <coughs> statements having objective truth values. And reductivism, I will talk about less. I'm going to concentrate on the anti-realist side of things here. And then the third observation is just that when we have arguments that involve let's say, certain kinds of everyday notions like knowledge, like degree of belief, like rational decision, uh, rational collective decision perhaps also, there's a kind of risk when we use mathematics of excess idealization because mathematics often is infinitary and it provides us with amazing tools for modeling things and maybe we sometimes go a bit too far. Uh, so for example, the problem of logical omniscience in epistemology so many systems that attempt to model um, principles for knowledge build in the fact that any logical truth is known or at any rate knowable. And so you know, we're then committed to having in some sense solved the decision problem for first order logic, which seems to say the least implausible. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about this anti-realism part of things. There's a long tradition of anti-realism in philosophy uh, about mathematical objects. So are you few... sure that it has to be philosophy of suspicion? Uh, uh, I mean, you have to pass it right. There's a long tradition in philosophy of suspicion about ah. abstract objects. Uh, for example, Aristotle, Mill, the early quiet, before he recanted and became a Platonist, uh, Archery Fields, Stephen Yadlow, Mary Lang, Joe Diazzuni. There's lots of people. This is a very incomplete list. Um, so we have this quote up here from uh, Burgess and Rosen, this kind of locus classicus of uh, the discussion around nominalism and, let's face it, anti nominalism, because Burgess and Rosen really want to come down on the anti nominalist side. They want to be realists, but nonetheless, they want to allow the Nominalists to kind of put their best foot forward. So they say nominalism as understood in contemporary philosophy of mathematics. You don't have to squint. I know the text is very tiny. I'll read it. Uh, arose not in the mathematical community. And here there's a kind of intended contrast, right, with something like finitism or constructivism, which arose out of mathematical developments amongst mathematicians. Um, it arose rather among philosophers, and to this day is motivated largely by the difficulty of fitting orthodox mathematics. That is to say, classical mathematics with all of these infinitary objects, 
into a general philosophical account of the nature of knowledge. And the difficulty largely arises from the fact that these special abstract objects apparently are seen to exist by orthodox mathematics. So, you know, we just read off what there is from what mathematicians talk about. Um, numbers, functions, sets, etc., are so very different from ordinary concrete objects. And so nominalism de denies the existence of any such abstract objects. Um, and this, as I say, is a relatively popular view amongst core philosophers, even sometimes as they try to use some mathematics to justify their views, sometimes even including their nominalism. We'll see an example of this later on. So very brief history. In the 1970s, uh, Quine and Putnam formulate an, their indispensability argument. So this is supposed to be uh, an anti-nominalist argument, a realist argument. Um, and I'm going to come on to that very shortly. And then in the 80s, Hartree Field in this book, Science Without Numbers, responds to the indispensability argument, um, tries to refute it basically by saying that all of science, or at any rate, uh, let's say all of science in principle and in practice, some small parts of physics um, can be nominalized. We can just have a scientific theory that doesn't quantify over mathematical objects, but only quantifies over physical objects. And because the indispensability argument is supposed to justify mathematical realism on the basis of scientific realism, um, so roughly the idea being that we have a scientific theory, it's got mathematical terms in it, and we need the mathematics to make the physical theory work, so therefore we're committed to the mathematics just as we're committed to the existence of those physical entities that we're also quantifying over. We've got electrons, and we also have um, whatever it might be, real numbers, or um, topological spaces, etc. cetera. Right. Um, and then, yeah, responding to field, we have people like Burgess in this book, for example, and Stuart Shapiro, etc., <coughs> critiquing science without numbers, and the debate goes on, as debates tend to do in philosophy. So what's this scientific indispensability argument? So we've got these two premises. Uh, this is a reconstruction due to Mark Colliban in a uh, kind of the standard book on this. Uh, although, as you'll see from the fact that we had to cross some of it out, perhaps not the best formulation. Uh, so the first premise is that we ought to have ontological commitment, meaning we ought to believe exist, uh, to all those entities that are indispensable to our best scientific theories, the ones without which those scientific theories won't work. Second premise, mathematical entities specifically are indispensable to our best scientific theories. And of course, this second premise is supposed to be supported by perhaps uh, some kind of empirical study of physical and mathematical theories and the use of mathematics in, in physics, paradigmatically, of course, in other areas too, but you know, the people who run these kinds of arguments, they like to talk about physics because it's really clear that it's the mathematics on the surface there. Um, and therefore, conclusion, we ought to have ontological commitment to mathematical entities. We ought to be realists about mathematics. We ought to think that these abstract objects really exist. So we want to kind of borrow this and move from science to philosophy. And so we have a reformulation in terms of philosophy, a philosophical indispensability argument. And in this philosophical indispensability argument, um, we have a somewhat different first premise. And the first premise says that we ought to have ontological commitment to all those entities that are indispensable to our preferred philosophical arguments. And notice here that it's not just philosophy that's changed and replaced science, but also uh, arguments have replaced theories. And I will talk a little bit about this and why this is, uh, but roughly the idea is just it's a little bit hard to pin down exactly what a philosophical theory is. And with arguments, it seems like we've got some kind of small controllable sub theory of some larger picture and we can maybe get at more easily what the mathematical substance of those arguments is. Uh, so then second premise, which again needs to be supported by case studies and that's what the bulk of this talk is going to be about. Mathematical entities are indispensable to some philosophical arguments and again notice that something has shifted here right so when we're talking about scientific indispensability what we're talking about in some sense is picture where we have our best science, and this is a kind of idealization, obviously not realized in practice. Um, we have our best science to which we're all, as a community of rational thinkers, committed. So we all believe in quantum mechanics and the standard model and 
we all believe in general relativity, and therefore we are perhaps collectively committed to uh, the mathematics needed to support that. Uh, whereas this has a much more relative feeling. So yes. in, in physics, one of the three big ways of formalizing or formulating quantum mechanics is the Feynman path integral. Mm -hmm. From a mathematical point of view, this is yeah, pixie dust and unicorn gears. There is no uh, rigorous treatment of this. I mean, for very special cases, people have read books about that. So, so then, ought this argument convey some religious? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, in some sense, I think so. Yeah, because uh, you know, this is why we need this. Not stated, of course, in Colliban's formulation, but nonetheless implicit. This fact about idealization and taking you know, our best science. So part of the background picture here is uh, in Quine's work, and the idea there is that we're going to have a scientific theory which is rigorously formulated and consistent and actually written down in, in first order logic. So, so this seems a little bit of a stretch, right? But nonetheless, that's the kind of idea in the background that you know maybe in principle this can be done. Whether or not it can, obviously that's a different business, but, but that's you know, the idea, and I think, you know, generally philosophers want to skate over these details. Uh, that's actually a very important point. Yeah, yeah, it's not just the detail, I agree, but anyway. So, uh, Dennis, has a, Dennis has a question. Yeah, hi, Benedict. So, just quickly, I assume that what C should, says more precisely is that proponents of these arguments ought to have ontological commitment at least to a minimum amount of those entities that are needed for those arguments, right? Not for mathematical entities in general. That's exactly right. Uh, and I'm going to come on to that. That's going to be part of our analysis. So this is really just, in some sense, the first pass. Um, so yeah, conclusion, proponents of those arguments ought to have ontological commitment to mathematical entities. And I think that you know, philosophers, say, who are taking this scientific indispensability argument seriously, think that in some sense this is all or nothing. Um, because the dividing line is between having these abstract objects existing at all and not, right? Between nominalism and realism. And we want to push a much more subtle picture on which you know, we care about how much, uh, as you might have guessed from this being known in a reverse math meeting. Well, yes. Can, can you specify okay, what you mean by exist, though? When you say like, oh. Is, no, but I mean, really, as you say that. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think. You know, like the really hardcore Platonist is going to think that exist means something like the same that you know I exist or you right. exist or tables and chairs exist, not in the same mode, of course, right? Because these are not physical entities, but nonetheless exist in the same kind of strong sense. Yeah, you, could, you, could, you, could, you could make a weaker statement that you know, like I don't think things exist. Like, Yeah, so, so there are many views of this kind, um, and where you know, we're just thinking of mathematics as being somehow instrumental. Um, and I think a lot of these anti-realists want to view it in exactly that way, and we're going to see a view like that shortly. Um, but yeah, we're really thinking exist in this strong sense. Sorry, Benedict, uh, I think Dennis has a follow-up. Yeah. Yep. yeah, sorry, just a quick follow-up. Just in this matter of existence, Whatever sense of existence you have, is it a sense of existence that would, for example, commit you to uh, the fact that there is there is a truth of the matter to the continuum hypothesis if you believe the reals exist and things like that? I mean, it might too, yeah. Um, not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of argument in this kind of scope, and, and some people think that you can have this kind of realism, but without having... Um, some kind of determinant truth value for all mathematical statements. But yeah, I, I think we're at least going to have it for, say, arithmetical statements and maybe um, statements in the language of second order arithmetic. Um, things beyond that, yeah, people argue about it. Um, and nothing, nothing I say is going to hinge on that one way or the other. So we're going to be looking at stuff low down. OK, so maybe now I can explain you know, some of this confusion and um, get into more detail. So suppose we have some theorem phi used in a philosophical argument A. Then our idea is, well, we're going to take phi, we're going to formalize it in the language of second order arithmetic. And usually this can be possible because a lot of 
mathematics used in philosophy is not you know, losing large cardinals. Um, it's not using forcing axioms. It's perhaps not even using like, you know, V omega plus four or something. It's, it's going to be really about natural numbers, real numbers, maybe functions on the reals. Uh, it's coming from discrete mathematics or probability theory, uh, maybe mathematical economics, we'll have some game theory perhaps. Um, but of course, we are also interested in potential counterexamples to this sort of general trend, you know, things where maybe the strength really does go up a lot. And we know that there are some examples of these, but they're not in necessarily going to be so convincing to our opponents. Um, so, you know, any examples that you can come up with would, of course, be gratefully received. Um, so then the idea is that we're going to assess the strength of this theorem by doing reverse mathematics. So, we, for example, we're going to prove that um, this theorem is equivalent to some principle P, whatever it might be. It might be equivalent to weak Koenigsmiller, to arithmetical comprehension, etc. And sometimes the reversal here is going to come off the shelf, as it were. It's going to come from the existing literature in reverse mathematics. Uh, and sometimes it won't. We'll have to do some work, or you look to do some work. Um, yeah. So one thing I'll maybe mention in passing, and perhaps we can come back to in the discussion, is whether there's some kind of philosophically correct base theory. Because, of course, whenever you do this, we have to work over some base theory or other. Uh, of course, we're going to be talking in terms of RCA zero, just because that's the standard base theory in reverse mathematics. But you know, one might have reason to think that we should be working with something different. Um, OK. But in any case, having carried out this process of proving this theorem phi used essentially in this argument, um, we discover that this principle P is thus a suppressed premise of this argument A. And so we can then ask, what does this mean for proponents of the argument and what it means for opponents of the argument? Because you know, now we're not talking in this scientific context where we think that you know, basically everyone's going to agree on the correct scientific theory at the end of the day, you know, in the moment. Um, with philosophical theories and arguments, it tends not to be like that. And there's intractable, deep disagreement. So we're always going to have people on one side and the other. So one thing to ask then is, is this principle P accessible to the proponents of that particular argument? So for example, if someone's a nominalist and they're using this uh, mathematical principle in their argument, then maybe there's something dodgy going on. Maybe then they're going to try and say, well, we should be nominalizing the theory in which we're carrying out the argument, and then we're going to go around a bit about that. But you know, in any case, there is at least possibility for tension there. Another thing is that I talked about somewhat uh, in a panel presentation is can opponents deny this principle P in order to reject the conclusion of A? Um, so, you know, normally when you have an argument uh, that is a, a valid argument, you want to deny the conclusion, you couldn't deny one of the premises. So maybe this offers more scope to opponents of certain arguments to um, deny that mathematical premise and therefore reject the conclusion of the argument. And this is kind of connected to the third bullet point. So if principle P entails the existence of complex sets, where I'm using this in a very vague way to mean, you know, non-computable, uh, arithmetical, hyper-arithmetical, uh, one one, pi one two, et cetera, does that tell us that this argument A, or perhaps the set of premises of A, are too idealized? theory of whatever they're talking about to be applicable in that particular philosophical domain. Of course, this, you know, your mileage will vary depending on what the philosophical domain in question is. What is the phenomenon that we're trying to model? What are the everyday concepts that we're trying to get a grip on? Whether that's knowledge, whether that's degrees of belief, whether that's um, judgment aggregation for some society. Just mm -hmm. so when you, when you mentioned like a principle piece or I assume it's a mathematical principle. And yeah, that's, uh, so something like we can explain the arithmetical comprehension. <coughs> because I guess we could assume that if we go back, so if P is supposedly an axiom, I mean, the way uh, axioms are chosen in mathematics uh, is based on initial, like some philosophical arguments. And so I guess we could like, imagine even going further and say, OK, so what philosophical argument supported the axiom which was equivalent to this? And then we could. Consider like obtain some kind of a mathematically free uh, hypothesis where so you you come back to the logical side and have like what is the right 
philosophical uh, premise, which uh, minimal philosophical premise, which of the yeah, yeah. Also. I mean, I think that's certainly something that we have to think about. I I guess I have a certain skepticism that we're going to reach some kind of mathematics-free logical bedrock that's going to yeah. justify this axiom. But people do try and push this argument, as I sort of mentioned at the beginning. You know, this kind of reductivist view, say, a logicist will think that maybe we can justify second-order arithmetic on purely logical grounds. It's not my view, so I'm going to be skeptical about this possibility. But certainly, there's scope to argue that way. Yes. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So, the way I understand it is that this third bullet point is kind of based on the idea that, in a way. Phenomena that we consider to be simple should be formalized or analyzed using a simple mathematical statement or, or something like that, right? It's not even about that exactly. It's more like things like suppose um, you're trying to model knowledge, then we shouldn't be positing that even an <laughs> idealized reader, uh, reasoner can compute the Holton problem, something like this. Okay, that's so a, so that's if a, we have an, an implication to our mathematical comprehension, then we think maybe something's gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that was what I wanted to stress that it might be that for very simple phenomena, you have to use some very strong mathematical theories. It doesn't necessarily mean that there is something wrong going uh, on, right? That's yes. I mean. Because, yeah, this seems to have a kind of a hidden premise that one should. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this doesn't really tell the whole story, yes. but the idea is that it's going to depend firstly on the domain and secondly, you know, you can't just read off what the model is yeah. from, from that principle. It's more like if you get a reversal to a strong principle, that's an invitation to look closer and yeah. be suspicious yeah. of what's yeah. going on. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's too weird. Yeah, right, it's exactly. We, exactly. Might exactly. we don't get that out yeah. for free. Yeah. We have to do some further work. Yeah. Yes, agreed. So here are some uh, examples. Um, had this table also in the panel presentation. Um, so this is mostly just to uh, impress on you that we thought about various things. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to talk about two of these, I guess. Maybe we can get to a third if we have time, but probably won't. So I'm definitely going to be talking about this squeezing argument, which uses the completeness of first order logic and uh, the possibility of democracy and possible connections with non principal ultra filters. Um, okay. So Starting off with our first case study, this is Kreisel's squeezing argument. Um, and the squeezing argument is taken by Kreisel to be paradigmatic of a method that he calls informal rigor. And the idea is that we can have some kind of precise determinate extension to some seemingly slightly nebulous philosophical concept like valid argument or valid sentence. Um, so, like mathematicians, philosophers obviously care about whether their arguments are valid, but unlike mathematicians, perhaps, uh, some philosophers don't take the standard definition of validity, the Tarskian definition of validity, for granted. Maybe they want an argument for it. And there are many reasons for this. Um, one is that um, Paradoxes like the liar paradox might lead one to think that logic ought to be weaker in order to avoid these paradoxes. So, you know, we might want to retain some kind of naive conception of truth, according to which, you know, something uh, phi is true if and only if phi is the case. But then we want phi to be able to contain the truth predicate and we get a contradiction. So maybe we want to weaken our logic to cope with these things. And so we might be suspicious of the uh, standard classical first order definition of validity. Um, How such a person function in the world? Sorry? <laughs> How does such a person function in the world? Good question. <laughs> We've often wondered. Um, yeah, so of course there's a lot of literature on this, you know, people who might be puzzled about this or try and argue in favor of this thesis that uh, this is the right definition of validity. I've got a few things here, but I'm not going to go through them. OK, so what is this squeezing argument? Well, it's an instance of a more general kind of argument, um, which aims to give a kind of mathematical analysis to, uh, to a, a seemingly informal or philosophical concept. And the idea is roughly as follows, that you propose some kind of narrow mathematical definition, which is sufficient for the concepts in question. Um, and so we 
provide an argument, a philosophical <coughs> argument, that satisfying the narrow concept is sufficient for satisfying the informal concept. And I'll go through a couple of examples in a moment. Then, having done this, you then argue for sat something satisfying the informal concept implies that it satisfies the wide concept. So in the case of validity, um, suppose we've got a sentence, the arguments are going to be that if a sentence satisfies this narrow concept of validity, and we have precisely a classical, uh, mathematically defined one, then it satisfies the informal or philosophical concept. And then if it satisfies the philosophical concept of validity, then it's going to fall under this wide, um, again, precisely mathematically defined concept. And then we have a proof that something falling under the extension of the wide concept implies that it falls under the extension of the narrow concept. Uh, so these first two steps are supposed to be you know, philosophical, they're supported by a philosophical argument, whereas the third step is provided by a mathematical theorem. Uh, so we have some possible squeezing arguments. Um, so, for example, for computability, so you might think that Turing computability is a kind of narrow concept. So if something can be carried out, a computation can be carried out by a Turing machine, then it can certainly be carried out by any kind of um, reasoner who is freed from certain practical bounds, like forgetting things, running out of time, and so on. And then you might have another argument that says, well, if something is computable in this way, then it's certainly going to be Gandhi computable, but then we know that we can mimic Gandhi machines on Turing machines, so that's a mathematical result, and therefore um, this notion, this informal notion of effective computability is squeezed between these two mathematical notions, and we have a precise extension. And similarly, uh, in this Chrysal paper that Walt mentioned in uh, his presentation to the panel, um, hyperarithmetical sets seem to be of the form that <coughs> make them predictively definable. We build them up from the ground up through this iterative process. Um, but then there's this kind of Ankara idea that uh, predicative objects need to be stable in some way, and so that implies that they're delta 1, 1. But then we know from Pliny that if something is delta 1, 1, then it's hyperarithmetical. And so this mathematical result performs this squeezing. Just a question. So, can the computability, so was it defined after Turing uh, paper? Yes. yes. And so, it like, uh, because in his original paper, Tring uh, also gave some kind of argument saying every effective computable should be uh, uh, yes. computable. So, yes. you mean that it was not accepted by Philip first? Um, no, I think people just like having more arguments for things. Okay. Um, so, 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 squeezing would also work like if you put string computable on the right side as well. I mean, yeah, if you, if, you, if, you, if you can argue convincingly, which you, you know, it's more or less what Turing is trying to do, is trying to provide a sort of conceptual analysis of computability. Um, and yeah, that would, yeah, in that, some sense, you have a, a sort of trivial squeezing argument then because you don't need the mathematical yeah. result. So, I guess we're reserving the term for something where you do need a substantial mathematical result to show that. The two sets are in fact uh, essentially the same. But so would you say that like Gandhi's argumentation about effective computable is not computable, so is somehow more convincing than uh, Turing arguments? So mm. does it does it I can say a lot about this offline, but um, for instance, remember Turing talks about the um, we don't need to take into account the two-dimensional aspect of you know, textbook, you know, calculations. With Gandhi machines, you can represent that directly without coding. Okay. And so <clears throat> then he just proves a theorem that a Turing computable can only have Gandhi computable. Okay. So that's why it's an example of squeezing. Yeah. Because it's it's a it's a sort of prima facie much more powerful definition. I mean I think the church claim you whatever that box is taken because of all the things that are equivalent to not just a few things. Right, I mean, it's just it's canonical. There's so many ways that you can describe computation; they're all equivalent. Right, so I, I don't think there's any doubt to that argument. Uh, philosophers will find reason to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but notice that this is a different kind of argument, right? Uh, not, I'm not taking issue with your argument. I think it's right, but I think it's a different kind of argument where you know you're basically saying any way that you come up with to cash out this informal concept ends up being the same mathematically equivalent thing, um, and we have a lot of them. This is a kind of more, in a way, empirical argument, uh, and one I find convincing, but I think yeah, other people might not. Perhaps so much the worst. The answer, of course, to, is to find some way to describe it that's different. Yeah, yeah. And right. that's good good luck to them, that. right? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so maybe I'll just briefly skim through this. Uh, so this is Kreisel's squeezing argument for validity. Um, so Kreisel was, I guess, interested in the notion of validity in mathematical practice before the emergence of mathematical logic. So a paradigmatic example of this might be um, Hilbert's Foundations of Geometry. And one way of reconstructing this is as a kind of substitutional process. So we have that phi follows from some set of premises gamma, if and only if for all structures. Um, G, if gamma is interpreted in G, then phi interpreted in G is also true. Um, so we're, we're just sort of substituting in whatever notions appear in that structure for the primitive terms in theory. But if you don't have a notion of structure, like one that, that is you know, precisely defined, and maybe you also don't have a clear, precisely defined notion of satisfaction, then you, know, you might wonder whether the standard Tarskian definition is correct. Maybe it doesn't take account of something. Maybe it's missing something. Um, maybe we're missing out on class size structures or something, right? So then Kreisel gives this argument. So we take D of psi to mean that psi is derivable in pure first order logic. Um, so it's a logical validity. And we assume that gamma is finitely axiomatized so that we have that psi follows from gamma in first order logic, if and only if um, gamma arrow psi is derivable. I mean, we should have conjunction gamma, but yeah. Uh, and then you have this pattern that conforms to this idea of a squeezing argument. So we've got these two philosophical things and then one mathematical thing. So the first is showing that the narrow concept implies the informal concept. So the narrow concept here is derivable in pure first order logic. And we give an argument sort of rule by rule. This could be whatever your favorite version of a proof theory for first order logic is, maybe natural deduction. And you just go through and say case by case, well, each of these rules uh, is one that allows you to perform a valid inference. And having argued successfully for all of them, you get the implication from D of phi to val of phi. Right, where val is our informal concept of validity. And then you argue by contraposition that if phi is valid, then it's valid in the Tarskian sense, right? Because if you have a, a set size structure, which is a counterexample to phi, then surely that's also an informal counterexample, right? We can sort of, let's say we just construct some set theoretic structure in which phi fails, therefore phi can't be a logical truth. Um, okay, so then again, this is an argument, but seems kind of reasonable. And I think, you know, for the people who are worried about the Tuscan notion of validity, it's actually the first step that's probably gonna break down. They're gonna probably be happy with the second one. And then thirdly, we just have the completeness theorem showing that the, um, oh, I think this is the wrong way around, but uh, never mind. No, no, yes, it's, it's the wrong way around. Sorry, okay. Yes. Uh, but anyway, okay. We do know what the completeness theorem is really. Uh, <laughs> so this is a mathematical result. And then we conclude that uh, phi is valid in the informal sense, if and only if it's valid in the standard Tarskian sense. Okay. And Kreisel calls this a philosophical proof. Um, and one of the successes of mathematical logic in philosophy that we've cashed out this informal concept in this precise formal way because of this argument. 
Um, okay. So then we finally get to do some reverse mathematics, having the completeness theorem in hand. So of course the completeness theorem is an explicit premise of this squeezing argument for validity. Um, and in the philosophical, philosophical literature on this, of course, we just assume the completeness theorem is true and it's provable. Um, but we also know that completeness can be formalized as a sentence in the language of second order arithmetic and that it's equivalent to weak Koenig's lemma over RCA zero. So assuming RCA zero in the background, we see that weak Koenig's lemma is kind of formal premise of this squeezing argument. So you can't accept the argument, regard it as sound, unless you also accept weak Koenig's lemma. <coughs> Uh, so this is a kind of paradigmatic example of what we're calling reverse philosophy. Uh, so the idea being that accepting some mathematical theory that plays an essential role in an argument is both necessary and sufficient for accepting that philosophical argument, uh, modulo its other premises, of course. So if you buy the philosophical premises and you buy the mathematical premises, then you're going to buy the conclusion. But if you reject the conclusion, then you can either reject one of the philosophical premises or perhaps one of the mathematical ones. Um, so, you know, this is in some sense a kind of trivial example, but there are a couple of things that maybe should make us take it a little bit more seriously. I mean, one thing is that uh, the implication um, from weak Koenig's lemma to the completeness theorem sort of confirms this claim that Kreisel makes that you don't need strong set theoretic assumptions to argue for this claim, right? So of course, when we formulate the completeness theorem in its most general form, then you get some fragments of the axiom of choice, but this is for these uncountable theories. When we're just looking at countable theories, then we just need with Koenig's lemma, which is not very much in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but also this fact that the completeness theorem implies with Koenig's lemma, and with Koenig's lemma, of course, is not confusably true. <laughs> this makes it difficult for people yeah, who are perhaps constructivists or nominalists to use this kind of argument to argue for um, the concept of validity being the Tarskian one, because uh, you know, if you're a constructivist, of course, you probably want to be compatible with everything being computable. And if you're a nominalist, then it seems like non-computable sets are going to be harder to nominalize anyway. So yeah, briefly touching more on nominalism, um, Patry Field in his book, Science Without Numbers, uses the completeness theorem in this kind of nominalization argument. So the argument runs something like this. I mean, this is kind of a sketch, obviously, but uh, basically, you know, first premise, in order to show that mathematics is dispensable, that it's eliminable from science, it's sufficient to show this premise two. And premise two is that uh, if you take a mathematical theory M and add it to a nominalized physical theory N, then what you get is conservative over N for um, sentences in the language of the nominalized physical theory. So this is only going to talk about nominalistically acceptable objects, you know, maybe electrons and space-time points, this kind of thing. Things that are really out there in some sense, at least according to field. Uh, and so there's a kind of philosophical argument for the first premise, which is that if the mathematics doesn't bring us new theorems in the nominalized language, then its value to science can only be a heuristic one, it can't be an essential one, right? If the nominalized theory by itself is sufficient to derive all of the consequences um, then we don't actually need the mathematical theory. Conservativity just shows us that, uh, you know, in principle, the mathematical part of the theory could be dispensed with. It's just a useful tool. And this is kind of the thing you were talking about, right? Um, and therefore, we have a mathematical argument for the second premise, that, which is just a kind of model theoretic conservation argument for this theory m plus n, where plus is not just like union, but also involves extending the schemas in this mathematical theory to 
uh, objects in the nominalized theory. So maybe we have something like induction or the separation axiom or something, and we're going to be able to not just talk about abstract mathematical objects, but also physical objects. Um, and Field uses the completeness theorem in order to show this. <laughs> so then the conclusion, the argument is that the coin Putnam indispensability argument doesn't work, right? So conclusion is that mathematics is in fact dispensable. Um, but, you know, it uses the completeness theorem, this looks like mathematics in, in the arguments, right? But on the other hand, maybe we can say something also a bit friendly to Field and say, well, in fact, you don't need a loss of set theory to carry out this argument, you just need uh, WKL0 and the consistency of the normalized theory. Um, so, you know, then maybe you can even reduce it to something weaker, depending on how strong exactly con N is. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there's a kind of tension here. Okay, so that was the squeezing argument and this discussion about nominalism. Now I'm going to talk about something somewhat different. And I'll try to hurry up because even if we started a few minutes late, I think I've been going a bit slowly. So I'm going to talk a bit about social choice theory and some arguments in social choice theory that use explicitly mathematical premises. So social <laughs> choice theory, more or less, is about collective decision making, um, as the name says. And the focus uh, I'm going to have is uh, preference aggregation. So the idea is things like elections voting situations um, or you know, any kind of societal choice making. Um, there are going to be some set of candidates or alternatives, ways that you know you might like the world to be. This candidate is elected or this policy is passed. Um, and preferences, of course, typically differ from individual to individual. We don't all have the same views about what the best thing to do is or what the best ranking of the possible alternatives is. So then we have a problem of preference aggregation. We have a problem of saying, well, everyone has slightly different views. How do we glue them together into a, a social decision? What we're actually going to do collectively as a society? Uh, and we want to do this presumably in a way that's both consistent and fair. And when I say fair, I mean respecting some perhaps even quite minimal sort of democratic norms, like if everybody agrees that x is better than y, then as a society we should conclude that x is better than y. That seems like a pretty reasonable minimal condition. Um, and then consistency, well we don't want to have things where say we have a rule like majority rule, where majority prefer a to b, the majority also prefer b to c, and then a majority uh, prefer c to a, and then we have some kind of inconsistency in the preference order. So Arrow's theorem suggests that it's impossible to be both consistent and fair in preference aggregation, uh, or at least this is the way that it's been read in a lot of the literature. Uh, and I, I will say that I'm far from being an expert in exactly what the arguments are here, so uh, I'm really in a way just looking at this sort of from, from the mathematical point of view at this point. So, okay, so what is a society in this framework? So Arrow sets it up in this kind of axiomatic way. Um, so it's, well, a society is a set of voters. It's a set of alternatives, X, um, at least three of them. And then you have derived from X, the set W of all strict weak orders. So these are binary relations that are asymmetric and negatively transitive. The idea being that you know, this is some kind of generalization of a linear, a strict linear order, but we can have ties. Um, then we have a set of all coalitions of voters, and this word coalition sounds very laden, but really it's just all of the subsets of the set of voters. It's the power set of the set of voters. And then we also have this set of profiles. So these are just like um, possible voting scenarios. So if we our set of V is everyone in this room, we might have an election, there are three candidates up, and we all say, okay, I'd prefer A to B and B to C, or maybe I'd prefer A and then B and C and neutral between, and we all we all get a vote. Right? So a profile is just a function from the set of photos to the set of weak orders. So a vote in this context is, is 
giving one of these weak orderings. Um, and then in Arrow's scenario, you just take all of these profiles, you know, just all of the possible combinations. And then Arrow has these axioms for judgment or decision making aggregation. Um, so a little bit of notation. We write f is equal to g on x, y when we've got x, y being alternatives and f and g are profiles. Uh, if for all voters v, uh, x, voter v under profile f prefers x to y if and only if they prefer x to y under profile g. So we're just saying that these, given these two profiles, all voters agree on the orderings of x and y in the same way, right? So I've got profile f and I, I prefer x to y there, and I prefer x to y also in profile g, and the same for everybody else, then we say that these two functions are equal on those alternatives. Um, and also the other way around. And the reason you have to have both conditions is just because um, there's also the option that x and y are, not, are neither you know, preferred or dispreferred to one another right there, but there's a time. Um, okay, so then given some society S, a social welfare function is a function sigma from profiles to orderings. So it's supposed to aggregate the um, individual preferences into some social preference. Uh, so it just produces one order that represents the, the choice of the whole society. And it's supposed to obey the following conditions, the first one being unanimity, I already mentioned this, so if every voter prefers x to y under profile f, then sigma also prefers x to y under profile f. Uh, and then this independence condition, it, which is uh, why I had all this stuff about f being equal to g. If, two, if f is equal to g on x, y, then uh, sigma of f is equal to sigma of g on x, y in the same way. I'm not sure why, but to set brackets around it there and not at the beginning, but it's supposed to mean the same thing. Um, so the idea here is roughly just that uh, if you have two different voting scenarios and the society as a whole has the same preferences about X and Y in those two scenarios, then whatever ordering uh, the social welfare function assigns to X and Y, it should be the same in both cases because everyone thinks the same things about X and Y. So in other words, what people think about other things than X and Y shouldn't come into the decision. It should only be people's relative ranking of X and Y in those two scenarios. Okay, and then the final condition is non-dictatoriality, which is that there's no dictator. There's no single voter who determines the social welfare function, right? So, so, so there's no V in big V such that for all profiles, if voter V prefers X to Y under profile F, then X is preferred to Y by the society as a whole. So they somehow determine, as it were, the whole society. I, mean, I don't really like this term determine, although it's used a lot in the literature and this whole idea of it being a dictator. It could just be, as far as I'm concerned, coincidence, but nonetheless it is taken to be. Yeah, this, is, this is the somewhat prejudiced uh, term used in the literature. Okay, so then Arrow's theorem just says, suppose you've got a society with a finite set of voters, uh, then there are no di non-dictatorial social welfare functions. They just, they don't exist. You can have dictatorial ones, but not uh, non-dictatorial ones. And then the literature, you know, in May, in sort of in the main part, after Arrow is, is about arguing over these um, axioms and saying, okay, which one should we drop? And, uh, you know, people mostly want to drop this and maybe weaken it and try to find some way of doing it or have some, yeah. And this involves things like, having some kind of more complicated way of comparing people's views in different scenarios. Uh, so Amartya Sen particularly famous for doing this, um, but I'm not really going to get into that now. So I just wanted to have this yeah, somewhat polemical quote from uh, Riker, 1982. Is that really Riker? <laughs> <laughs> That's a coincidence. Uh, 
The main thrust of Arrow's theorem and all the associated literature is that there is an unresolvable tension between logicality, so that's what I was calling consistency before, and fairness. To guarantee an ordering or a consistent path, independent choice requires that there be some sort of concentration of power, dictators, oligarchies, or collegia of voters in sharp conflict with democratic ideals. So this is what he takes to be the lesson of Arrow's theorem, which I think is pretty strong, but in any case, so following this, there were some infinitary developments in uh, social choice theory. So we see that, you know, in the finite case, of course, we've got contradiction from assuming that all of these axioms hold. Um, so then Fishburne in 1970 says, well, we can just kind of escape Arrow's theorem if we allow V to be infinite. And the way he does this is basically to construct a social welfare function by using a non-principal ultra filter. Obviously, if um, V is, say, countably infinite, then we're going to have the coalition of voters just being you know, the set of all natural numbers effectively. Uh, and then you have a non principal ultra filter over this. Of course, this you can't prove in ZF. Um, and so some of the reaction to that was about this assumption that seems kind of strong. Uh, and then a couple of years later, Kerman and Sonderman had this nice analysis of uh, Arrow's theorem in terms of ultra filters. And based on this, they, they claimed that even infinite societies have these invisible dictators, namely the members of the non principal ultra filter. Um, and basically, the idea was something like because the ultra filter is closed uh, upwards under set inclusion, you're going to get smaller and smaller sets that are still dictatorial. If they're always going to be infinite, of course, but. Uh, you know, they seem to think that this was problematic in some way, and they have this uh, measure theoretic argument about this. Um, and then a couple of people had a go at looking at this using computability theory. So Alain Lewis in 1988 and uh, Reju Mihara in 1997. And they basically showed that infinitary non-dictatorial social welfare functions are non-computable, and so in some sense unusable. And this is kind of speaking to this third point in our in our program that, that uh, you know, this is in some sense like identifying uh, an excessive idealization, right? Uh, and I'm going to be able to be a bit more precise about that shortly. So Mihara 1999 shows, uh, uh, you know, so this is a couple of years later in this follow-up paper, he says, okay, so we can't, we can't do this computably. Can we maybe do it computably relative to some oracle? And yes, you can do it relative to an oracle for the double jump. Uh, and then he puts in that paper an open problem, which is, uh, can you do it uh, relative to the jump? Um, as far as I know, this is still open. I emailed him last year to ask about it. He said that no one had solved it as far as he knew. Uh, but then I don't think that so many people have worked on this. OK, so since I'm running out of time, I'll try and go very quickly through this. Um, So the kerman sonderman theorem, this is the analysis in terms of ultra filters that I was talking about, says, OK, suppose you've got a set of voters V, set of alternatives X, uh, X greater than or equal to 3, as usual. You have to have this condition. If you only have two voters, then, then you can consistently have a social welfare function that satisfies Arrow's uh, axiom. So maybe we can have a democracy in America or in the UK where we only have two parties, but uh, other places it's impossible. Um, and then consider this set U sigma of sigma decisive coalitions. So the sigma decisive coalitions are just the ones that, that will win in all scenarios. Uh, so it's like a generalized notion of a dictator where it's not going to be a singleton, but it's going to be some larger set. Of course, the set B of all voters is um, sigma decisive because uh, by the unanimity condition, the set of all voters is always going to win. Um, and then this set of sigma decisive coalitions forms an ultra filter on the power set of the set of voters such that u sigma is non principal if and only if sigma is non dictatorial. So we have this nice classification of social welfare functions um, in terms of ultra filters. And this shows that, you know, if it wasn't clear already from the Fishman result, that the existence of non dictatorial social welfare functions. Um, 
for all infinite societies can't be proved in ZF because you know take some such function then constructs this ultra filter of decisive coalitions. It's going to have to be non principal and therefore we've got a non principal ultra filter over N. Um, okay, so then reverse math question can we formalize and then prove versions of Fishburne's theorem and the Kerman Sonderman theorem in second order arithmetic? Obviously, we're not going to be able to prove this full thing uh, where we've got the power set, but maybe we can squish it down into something countable. And can we get reversals to known systems? And the answer is yes. So the idea here is just to restrict to countable subalgebras of the power set of the set of voters and the set of all functions from voters to weak orderings. Um, I have these definitions, but I guess I'm not really going to go through them because I'm running out of time a bit, but we can come back to them uh, either in the questions or afterwards if people are interested. But basically the idea is just that we've got a countable algebra of profiles. So this is just a Boolean algebra. Uh, presented in the standard way in second order arithmetic. Um, and then we need to make sure that um, basically that the, the set of profiles and the set of coalitions are kind of sufficiently closely related to one another. Um, so we have this notion of measurability, um, which, yeah, just, just sort of ensures that we can kind of decode particular coalitions that prefer one alternative to another um, based on what profiles we have. And then we also have this way of um, embedding uh, partitions of the set of photos into the, uh, the set of profiles. So you know, this is really just saying that the two things are kind of sufficiently close to one another. You can achieve these closure conditions, you know, easily in a kind of non-computable way by, uh, for example, the, the approach that most people have had up to this point is just to say, well, we're going to just take some algebra of coalitions and then we're going to take all of the um, profiles that are measurable by some set in this algebra. Um, but you can do it in a bit more of a delicate way, which is more or less what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so then definition, instead of a society, we've got a countable society, and this is a set of voters V, a finite set of alternatives with x greater than or equal to three, um, countable algebra of sets of voters, and a countable profile algebra such that that uh, countable profile algebra is uniformly a measurable. So it just means that we've got a function that does the measuring. You can prove these functions exist in ACA zero, but if you assume that it exists, then you can do it in RCA zero. Uh, and similarly, that A is partition embedded into F. So it just means. Basically, if you've got any, you know, in fact, in the actual proofs, you only need partitions of size four. Um, but I did something more general just because maybe it's useful in the future. Um, okay, so then definition suppose you've got a countable society F, then sigma from n to w, um, because we can't have functions from the set of profiles, of course, but we can have a function from the indices of the profiles. Um, is a social welfare function if it satisfies versions of the unanimity condition and the independence condition, and then if it obeys the following obvious formalization of the non dictatoriality condition, then we say it's non dictatorial, right? Just for all voters, there's some profile where, where that um, voter doesn't get their way. And then you can formalize Fishburne's possibility theorem in AC0. So that's just the statement that for all countable societies with an infinite set of voters, there's a non-dictatorial social welfare function. And then the proof is really just the same as Fishburne's original proof or the proof that Kerman and Sonderman give. You just construct, you, you take some algebra and, um, well, you take the society, which includes the algebra, you show that there exists a non-principal ultra filter over that algebra. You can do this in ACA zero, it's a standard result. Um, and then from that, you define, you use that as the set of decisive coalitions and define uh, a uh, social welfare function. Interestingly, the social welfare function that you get is not unique. You can get several different ones from this. Um, so this is what I mean by the fact that the proof goes via a weak converse of the kerman sonderman theorem. So with the kerman sonderman theorem, we get this unique ultra filter for any given um, social welfare function. But going the other way, it's not, it's not unique. Um, 
But interestingly, this, this proof lets us establish some seemingly stronger versions of Fishburne's possibility theorem, and one of which reverses to ACA0. So one of my open questions is, does FPT itself reverse to ACA0? Um, so I won't go through all of these, but uh, the one that reverses to ACA0 is this one, which is that uh, this notion of a cofinite coalitions property. If you have a better name for this, I'm also happy to hear that. But basically it just says, for all natural numbers, I, when cofinitely many voters are such that they prefer X to Y, then the social welfare function also prefers X to Y. You might think this is pretty natural, given our analysis in terms of ultra filters, because, uh, of course, you know, uh, every, you know, every non-principal ultra filter refines the Frisch filter. So, okay. Um, so then we have the statement FPT plus, which is just FPT replacing non-dictatoriality with this cofinite coalitions property and obviously it implies non-dictatoriality and it implies non-dictatoriality also for uh you know oligarchies let's say of size two three four any n right um so then we just have these intermediate statements which you know i don't know whether they all collapse into the same thing or whether there's some kind of strict hierarchy there but at any rate this thing fpt plus is at the top with uh, reversing to ACA zero, and then the rest of them, are <coughs> at least below that, and beyond that, I don't know. But we can also formalize the Kelvin Sonderman theorem in ACA zero as this statement KS, and that, this just says for all countable societies S and all social welfare functions sigma 4S, the set of uh, indices for sigma decisive sets uh, exists, and this is where you get punched from the existence. Um, and it forms an ultra filter on the set of coalitions A, and it's principal if and only if sigma is non-dictatorial. So of course, to get it uh, <coughs> non-principal, we need V to be infinite, and that's the case we're basically most be considering. Um, to prove this, you basically do two things. The first is to prove this lemma, um, and I think maybe the lemma is not really required in the sort of strong form that we have, but it means you get a nice kind of computability theoretic corollary out of it, um, which is that, um, yeah, that uh, the set of sigma decisive coalitions is uh, computable relative to the jump of the social welfare function. Uh, and then basically you just go through this long process of verifying that uh, this u sigma is in fact an ultra filter. And this is where you need things like this measurability condition and um, partition embedding. Um, yeah. And so what you get at the end is that KS is provable in ACA zero and hence, so is Arrow's theorem. You can just easily derive Arrow's theorem because any non-principal, sorry, any, any ultra filter over a finite set is of course principal and therefore that's a dictator. Um, by the way, you can sort of there. Okay, and then, yeah, following uh, Antonio's talk, I was inspired to change this uh, bottom bit. It's almost a theorem. Uh, I think that Arrow's theorem itself is provable in RCA zero, and thus in PRA, because, you know, it's really a first order sentence. In fact, I think a high zero one sentence. Um, so basically, the way you do this is you just carry out the same proof of the kerman sonderman theorem, but because you're always doing it for finite sets, you just need to stick some appropriate primitive recursive bounds in a couple of places. And I think you can do it in like basically uh, like a double exponential or something. Um, but I haven't gone through all of the details, so it's not quite, I'm not ready to call it a theorem yet. And I think you can even do it in something weaker. I think it's pretty natural to say you can do it in I delta naught plus exponentiation. Uh, you know, it's not a particularly combinatorially complex thing. Okay, and then we get some reversals. So following our equivalent over RCA0, um, ACA0, KS plus FPT and FPT plus. So I talked already about FPT plus, um, and basically the way this proof works um, is just to kind of mimic the standard sort of ultra filter argument. So going from existence of a non-principal ultra filter to arithmetical comprehension by showing that you can code in the jump 
in this argument. I tracked it back to a paper of Kirby in the 80s, but maybe it's older. Um, but you basically do the same thing in both places to get ACA0. So in the case of KS plus FPT, the argument is in some sense just really obvious. Say, so, okay, I've got a countable society, therefore by uh, FPT, I've got a non dictatorial social welfare function you know, for an infinite society, obviously. Um, and therefore, by KS, I've got this ultra filter of decisive coalitions, and the ultra filter must be non principal. Therefore, by this standard argument, <coughs> arithmetical comprehension. So, this leaves us with some interesting questions that I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, so summary, I talked about all this a lot, so I won't go over it again, but basically, you know, reverse math offers us this nice fine-grained way of calibrating the strength of the mathematical commitments of philosophical arguments, we can locate excess idealizations, and maybe we can also, as hopefully seen in this last part, uh, contribute some new sources of reversals to reverse math. And I think that you know, social choice theory offers a few things that could be looked at, you know, it's, you know, it's basically Kind of infinitary combinatorics at this point. So maybe there are some nice things to look at there. Um, okay, so I'll just finish on these mathematical and philosophical open questions. So there are some methodological questions that you, know, kind of, you might naturally have been thinking about as I talked in the first part. So what's the right base theory? Should we use uh, ICA zero star because we need higher equivalences? What are the problems that come with that? Should there be a single base theory, or is it going to be relative to different arguments, maybe in different areas of philosophy? Um, are there philosophically relevant theorems that aren't naturally formalizable in the language of second order arithmetic? So I'm counting on you for this. Uh, and how is logical strength related to idealization? And then we have some things for the case studies. So we've got the squeezing argument for validity, maybe we've got the squeezing arguments for other things, but are there Squeezing arguments for other validity concepts like uh, intuitionistic validity or uh, validity in relevant logic, this kind of thing. And what do they require? Is it the same? Is it different? Um, social choice theory, there are lots of other theorems that one could look at. Halsinus theorem, the Gibbard Satterthwaite theorem, uh, which is kind of similar to our Aris theorem, it's about uh, basically tactical voting. Um, and then some you know, more focused questions like, is FPT strictly weaker than FPT plus? So maybe it reverses to something between RCA0 and ACA0. Um, and what about these other principles, FPT uh, less than n and FPTK for k greater than or equal to 2? Do we get all of these things collapsing into one, or is there some kind of hierarchy there? Uh, and yeah, in formal epistemology, I think I just mentioned this in the panel, but uh, yeah, we could look to see if there are Dutch book theorems that reverse to, to stronger principles, like maybe ACA0 might be required under some circumstances. I don't know about this one, it's very special. Okay, so that's it. Thanks. Oh, so thanks very much. That was, that was great. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, regarding your third mm -hmm. methodological item, right? Mm -hmm. So it's less well known in reverse math, but in constructive analysis, there's many of these theorems that say, say we, this fixed point theorem is non constructive, hit the reject button. Mm -hmm. However, uh, an epsilon version is good. Mm -hmm. And so, and because, well, data we get from the LHC tends to be finite, easy physicists. Uh, these epsilon versions are enough for mm. if you mm. get down to brass tags or tags of uh, <coughs> yeah uh, yeah what what do you really need when you're doing science yeah. so um, yeah, yeah it, at least for analysis you could use I, I would I would conjecture like you could always do this like yeah. whatever ah oh, no I need ACA zero WPL no 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 the epsilon version is enough that doesn't say anything about common theory so yeah yeah. But I, no, I, I take your point, and I think this is related also to this last point. So I was talking about stronger things, but I think I think there's probably a lot of mileage to be gone in just like saying, okay, probably a lot of these Dutch book type arguments do not require anything more constructive. Uh, certainly, the finite case, I'm pretty sure, can be done. Certainly in RCA zero, probably in a constructive version of RCA zero. 
Yeah. Even even then, if you could, I mean, yeah, even even if somehow even a theory, there is presumably the upside. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, but that also suggests a kind of philosophical argument from that, right? Which is, you know, um, we've got these people proposing this uh, probabilist thesis um, based on these, you know, fairly strong mathematical presuppositions. Then you might want to say, well, we can prove these epsilon versions uh, of, of these results, and maybe that means that you know this model that we have of uh, you know how we assign credences as, as real numbers. I mean, this is just like overly idealized, and we should really be thinking about like computable real numbers or something like this. Um, you know, so I think that that's you know that kind of argument is actually really useful in, in kind of getting into the details of, of what those people are doing. So, uh, are you maybe worried that? So, what problem with this point of appeal is that it could be used maliciously. <laughs> so, somebody could decide they're going to pretend to be an ultra finitist just to argue with everybody else and knock down their arguments. And um, in some cases, it feels like it's okay, you require ACA not to, to have some philosophical argument. But it would also be missing the point to argue about whether or not you see that is true because you really want to use this. Um, are you concerned at all about this? Uh, no, I mean I think philosophers like to like you know try and do this stuff all the time. People are used to it. Uh, so you know there are all kinds of crazy positions that people will take, and you sometimes think, yeah, but you're just doing this to be difficult about this. So I think this is, in, some, in that sense, I think it's just kind of run-of-the-mill philosophy. So I'm not particularly worried about it. Um, but you know, I take your point. This is absolutely something that someone could do. Um, I think I think what will happen in practice is that you know, suppose I, I go and say, okay, you've got this argument, and you know, it relies on some mathematics, not too much, but actually, I don't believe in even that, and so I'm going to reject your argument. I think what will happen is just like broadly speaking, people accept mathematics and we'll say, okay, but you know, you, you can have your crazy view, but uh, we're going to carry on believing in this argument because we think the mathematics is true. Well, sometimes uh, there are discussions amongst logicians of people claiming they think that the arithmetic is false. Mm -hmm. And I find it very hard to believe that people take this thing seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, for an argument, but maybe, maybe, but uh, I don't know. I think in some sense, this is, you know, like the more that people try and do this in some sense, this is kind of, I think many philosophers call it in some way kind of view it positively because basically they enjoy arguing. And uh, so, you know, the more grounds there are to argue on in some sense, the better. Uh, I, I also have, you know, problems with disbelief of like some of the positions that people take, but uh, yeah, that's that's the game in some sense. Other questions? Anyone anyone online? Okay. Um, would you happen to have another example of the word similar to the one you gave uh, by Hartford Fick, who relies on the completeness behind what you say, or oh, then there might be a big error going on there? And to his uh, nominated position and the fact that he's using mathematics forever, that's what that's the principle. Uh, do you have any other example like this? Or well, I've got um, another Hartree Field example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I, mean, I think I had it back on the uh, the slide with all the uh, the things, yeah. It was right at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, but uh, I mean, there you're not actually using the you know the fieldian theory of truth to argue for nonverbalism, yeah. but you know, nonetheless, you might think is are this person's philosophical views coherent if they're you know presumably trying to get something substantial out about the nature of truth from using uh, this revision hierarchy that's you know pi one three complete or something? Well, maybe it's not quite pi one three complete. Yeah, it's more than delta one three. Yeah, I, during my talk, I gave this example of Borel, Bear, and the gang, mm -hmm. who, who essentially were saying, "Ah, oh, the axiom of choice, you can countable choice." No, 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 no way in hell. They rejected. And then people pointed out, "Yeah, but like half of your theorems 
apply some version of the axiom of choice even crazier than what yeah. we reject. And Bonnell had a nice sort of way out of this, but yeah, way out. It was a way out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he essentially, essentially said, look, he, he, he was a god fearing Platonist, and he said, well, but the axiom of choice sort of describes mathematical reality in the same way that theories from physics describe physical reality. And they guide us to new ideas, etc., etc. But the axiom of choice is not real; it's not part of mathematical reality. Yeah. I actually always had a slightly different reading of that passage, right. which was more like Hilbert's saying. I mean, Hilbert obviously was. I think Hilbert was, you know, still some kind of realist, but but you know, officially had this kind of finitist view and was taking these infinitary objects to be these ideal elements. Right. My reading of that passage was always more like that. That that. Uh, we should take things like the axiom of choice as instrumental and in guiding us to the truth as, as instruments, not necessarily as you know being how the uh, concrete mathematical reality is out there, even if we can always describe it. I, I'm not a scholar of this stuff, so it's just, just my interpretation. Um, but I mean, in answer to your question, I guess I don't have other examples off the top of my head, maybe Walt does, but. Uh, yeah, surely it's not so hard to come up with it. You know, philosophers love to use like the computers there and all these magical logical tools that let them do stuff and then pretend that they're not. Yeah, I mean, if I could just say quickly yeah. in regard to David and Adrian's point simultaneously, that we're on the outside of this, and it's surprising how prevalent these nominalistic or reductive logistic style views are in what really the center of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the simplified form of what we're trying to call attention to is just that there is an apparent tension um, between people who simultaneously want to use mathematical tools uh, in their work and then have sort of foundational or almost metaphysical views that say things that can be simplified to mathematical objects that don't exist or communities don't exist. I, I remember a discussion about Kaisel with people who knew him. And sort of I said like look Kaisel sounds like just your own of the mill philosopher. Like the, their their ultimate goal would be sort of to derive everything from nothing by a pure reason. And then, then of course they fail miserably because yeah, there's all these mathematical assumptions. Yeah, and but Kreisel wanted to call attention to precisely that, right? As a sort of progenitor of reverse. Yeah, okay. Kreisel wasn't uh, immune to this either. Was the point? Well, just that I'm surprised about this because you don't you know, really need to reverse math to see that there is a term cheap here, right? And you need to reverse math right. to show that so what's the actual amount of tension, right? But, but so, so <laughs> but, like you that seems right. weird to but, so so part, but, but, have agreed, agreed. Right. but people aren't aware of it, although a partial counterexample to that is again Hertry Phillips himself, yeah. who then is aware sort of of what we pointed out, maybe yeah. not that you could use the point yeah. zero two conservativity of computing and all that over PRA. But um, he actually wants to, he has a paper which he tries to nominalize the completeness theorem. Um, Precisely to respond to this kind of worry. Yeah. Okay. But I think the other thing that the, the reverse mathematical analysis does, I mean, obviously, the important thing is that it allows us to pinpoint the sure. exact right. point of tension, but right. I think having an exact point makes the kind of rhetorical point much more effectively than just saying, oh, well, you seem to be using some mathematics in this That's ostensibly true. not and the other thing that we want yeah, People might just think that you can escape from it somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the other thing that we want to say back to the core of philosophy is that the right way to understand these things is to use the tools of computability theory and reverse mathematics and not higher set theory. Yeah. According to field, is it that this is all the way down? Or... <laughs> so there, I, I, there's also a comment slash suggestion from Harvey. So he adds, so the question would be, what do you think of this comment slash suggestion? Tell us what you think. So uh, he says, uh, it is a deep, dark secret that is now coming out some that the use of real numbers in physical science is completely ridiculous. Whoa. Being merely a convenient way of avoiding some really difficult foundational work. The relevant mathematics lives in around B6 in the cumulative hierarchy. Of course, the reals are a totally legitimate concept, but are only silly for physical science. So we need to rethink everything in math and math logic in terms of universes like V6, a whole new ballgame for R and math. So that's, that's the sixth level. D6. 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 
Wait, is that V omega plus six or plus six? Six. Five nine. Five nine. Five nine. Five nine. So like <laughs> So, so I'm like, oh, you should know better than six. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sign of how different different the logic of v6 is is that for, for is that except for to, totally trivial setup of v6, no axioms beyond predicate logic are needed to prove even deep theorems about v6. I mean, what do you think of this? I, I mean, it's assuming that the universe is finite, right? Which maybe it's reasonable, but I feel like I'm going to leave that one. To the well, no, but can I can I put a question back to Harvey? Yeah, Harvey okay. could even maybe. Well, should I uncheck the mic? I don't know if I can or if Dennis can. Yeah, Harvey, you can speak now. Okay. Does it, does it, wait a minute. I've got to. Uh, Harvey, you can speak now. Yeah, I'm going to mute you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> but can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can't see me, right? That's coming. Here we go. We've got the okay. We've got the gallery, so I don't know if we need to allow it. I mean, go ahead because the next talk's in five minutes, so we should go. So just go ahead. I think we need to take yeah. a little bit longer break. We, we can. We go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. Okay. All right, so you know there is a, a thing called "it from bit" by Wheeler. In other words, uh, there's an idea somehow, and also very, very strongly, uh, 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 Wolfram. Yeah, uh, that uh, uh, one should go back to bits and information uh, and so forth. Now, I I know I'm nowhere near competent to really evaluate what these people are really saying, but I do know that those headlines. So now V6 means you start with the empty set and you build power set six times. I think you get a number like, I'm trying to remember what it is, two to the two to the 16 or something. Uh, if you don't like that, you can go to V7. Uh, the point is this, uh, it turns out that there are short proofs and predicate calculus of induction and just about any set theoretic thing that's true in that universe, just by pure predicate calculus and only five pages. In other words, we don't actually use two to the two to the 16 steps in the proof. Uh, and uh, because of that, there's a, there are questions like this that I don't know the answer to. Uh, if you take Fermat's last theorem for V6, <laughs> uh, uh, is that provable? Uh, uh, in is that ha does that have a short proof uh, in uh, uh, in predicate calculus? <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, uh, look, I'm not going to go on forever about this, but the point is that um, rethinking the whole of mathematics, where it's understood that everything is finitary, um, is very. I mean, it it takes a lot of of, of thinking about how to do this because. Uh, uh, you want robust results, and you're talking about specific things, and that those are hard to mix, but not not nearly impossible. So this is a whole new kind of territory, I think, for RM. Now, look, I'm not, I don't deny that real numbers are completely good concepts. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a nominalist. <laughs> I, in fact, I'm not anything. Okay, but but but. Uh, Except a, a foundationalist, if you want to call it that. But uh, the point is that that uh, this is a, a very attractive point of view uh, in many ways, and opens up rethinking every single thing we ever did in logic and math. Well, Harvey, like, no, let's, let's, okay, let's, let's, I think we need to stop at this point. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, thank you. That was a great.